and set this conversation on the right note. Um, my name is Irfan Nuruddin. I'm a professor in the Asian Studies program at the School of Foreign Service here at Georgetown. And on behalf of Georgetown, allow me to extend a very warm welcome to all of you, especially, especially to those of you who are not part of our immediate university community. Thank you for making the trip in. I like to say I've been at Georgetown now for eight months. I like to say there's many advantages to Georgetown. Getting to and from it is not one of them. <laughs> you know, but, uh, um, or finding parking. Or finding parking, <laughs> yes. Uh, um, yes, indeed. So, I wel welcome all of you. Thank you for making the trip in. Um, by some measures, India has been, has once again become a hot topic for conversation in DC. And in fact, this week is a good illustration of it with an event at GW yesterday, events at Carnegie, Brookings, USIP today, a very big event at CSIS tomorrow, and of course the World Bank and fund annual meetings that have a large number of people from the subcontinent here. Um, that's very exciting, but it also suggests one of the problems in conversations about India, which is we tend to have a very short-term memory. Because by another measure, India has never left the conversation in DC, and in particular because of the conflict in Kashmir, which remains, unfortunately, 70 years later, a flashpoint uh, in a region that is now nuclearized and that involves, at this point, three of the world's most populated countries, all of whom have nuclear capa capabilities in India, Pakistan, and increasingly China, right? And so, I think in a, among a small circle of people who are state informed, uh, India has, and Pakistan have not left that conversation. But I'm hoping, and I think a lot of us share that hope, that the renewed focus on the subcontinent, thanks to President Obama's high profile visits to India uh, and the Indian PM's visit to the United States, will once again infuse this discussion with some constructive energy so we can find a solution to these long standing problems. Over the course of the afternoon, our hope is to discuss critically the problems that affect Kashmir and through it, India and Pakistan. In the spirit of a university based conversation, we hope that and expect that it will be done civilly and respectfully, seeking to understand different viewpoints rather than to win a debate. Right? I mean, and so, what we have done is very actively sought out the best thinkers and intellectuals who had something, I think, unique to say about Kashmir to offer their expertise. And we're very fortunate to have them here with us today. Before we begin with the formal part of uh, this afternoon, let me take a minute to thank you know, the various people who have made this possible. Um, the university has come together in suggesting that India and the subcontinent more generally to, should be an area of strategic engagement over the coming years. And over this past year, with the help of the Office of Global Engagement and the Asian Studies Program, with help from Security Studies Program, from the Department of Government from the Lecture Fund at Georgetown. We have had a series of events. We started with Jairam Ramesh back in September. We hosted Mr. Shiv Kemka in November. There have been other events featuring Maruf Raza talking about Indo-Pakistan uh, back in October. Manoj Mitter talking about Gujarat uh, earlier again in the fall. And culminating in today's conclave and then the keynote address by Mr. Abdullah uh, this evening at 5 o'clock in Gaston. We hope all of you can make it to that uh, event. We expect it should be very, very interesting. Of course, beyond the institutional support, it takes people to get this going. And Dai Ali, who's sitting here in the second row, uh, along with her colleague Kat Fisk over in Asian Studies, have worked tirelessly, as have the student leaders of the Georgetown India Dialogue. So if you see any of them, uh, do me a favor and say thank you to them. They've worked. Without them, none of this would have been possible. I'm, I just get to be the person standing at the front of the room, but they're the ones who have made made it possible for me to be here. Without further ado, especially since we are uh, running on time, I, I'm tempted very much to make a joke about Indian stretchable time at this point, about you know the difficulty of starting any event on time. I'm sure there's a whole bunch of RSVPs who thought of one o'clock invitation that they should come at three o'clock. But, <laughs> uh, but that's for dinner, not for a conclave. Uh, but because you have made the effort to be on time, I'd like to start us on time. And without further ado, I'd like to invite our first three panelists up. Uh, and while, I, while they come up, let me introduce them to you. Uh, Dr. Lisa Curtis is a senior research fellow at the Heritage Foundation here in Washington, D.C. Dr. Ehsan Bhatt is a fellow at the Belfast Center at Harvard University and an assistant professor of political science at George Mason University. And uh, as a small side note, 
uh, is a graduate of Ohio Wesleyan University, which is where I went to school as well, though 10 years before he did. Um, so it's, uh, it's nice finally to make uh, personal contact with someone I've heard a lot about from my former uh, professors. And finally, uh, Dr. Moeed Yusuf is the director of South Asia programs at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, he was just telling us that uh, over the course of today, he is also playing host to a parliamentary delegation from Pakistan uh, as well. So, you know, this is not just India, this is really the region as a whole engaging with Washington, D.C. At, after this panel, we'll have a second panel. Our panelists this morning are going to focus more on the, or this afternoon, will focus more on security issues. Uh, but we want to take the conversation beyond just the one dimensional note that too many conversations about Pakistan and India and Kashmir often are about, which is security. And our second panel uh, will focus more on politics and identity issues. And we'll close then with a broad conversation uh, featuring uh, Stephen Cohen from the Brookings Institution. So a varied set of conversations over the course of the afternoon. We've uh, agreed on a rough order of um, a presentation, uh, starting with a big picture overview of the conflict and the sit situation as it currently stands. Uh, Lisa suggested that her take will be slightly more pessimistic, and then we're going to count on Moe to end on a slightly more optimistic note. Uh, and we'll open it up at that point to uh, public Q&A, and I'm sure you'll have lots of questions for these panelists. But without further ado, please join me in welcoming these panelists up here, and then I'll hand it over to Dr. Bhatt. Thank you everyone for showing up. Uh, thank you to Irfan Murugi and Bhagani and Georgetown uh, for organizing this conference. I think it's really interesting, it's really great. Um, I'm going to restrict my comments to uh, three basic sets of issues. Um, they are putting Kashmir in a general context when it comes to separatist conflict, separatist war. Uh, thinking about nationalism and national identity and how uh, those processes play into uh, the issue at hand. And then saying one or two things about uh, sort of implications for today in terms of dispute resolution, although I know uh, these guys will have a lot to say about that. Um, so the first thing I would say about uh, the Kashmir conflict is that it's a pretty common type of conflict. It's a very common type of conflict. Secessionist wars uh, between nine, they were about between 1945 and 2000, something like 95 or 96 uh, secessionist wars in international politics. Uh, and these secessionist wars are not, you know, sort of quickly over. Uh, they tend to last a long time, on average 11, 12, 13 years. Um, so immediately we can sort of see that you know Kashmir is not a very special case. You know these things happen uh, pretty regularly in national politics. And in fact, because so many of these wars happen, and because these wars tend to last a very long time, uh, again between 1945 and 2000, uh, the average year saw 25 such conflicts arrive at any given point. Uh, so again, these are very very common uh, types of conflicts. Uh, the second thing I would say is, again, it's uh, the Third, uh, secessionist conflicts, separatist conflicts, <coughs> often involve, often incite, often motivate uh, third party involvement. Uh, There's broadly speaking two types of civil wars uh, in international politics. One, one are sort of ideological civil wars, those are when you might have a right wing government trying to take on a left wing, sort of a right wing movement taking on a left wing government, or a left wing government, a uh, left wing movement taking on a right wing government. Or you, on the other hand, you have separatist types of wars where uh, you have a nationalist movement that's really trying to change. Uh, the borders or the, the boundaries of a state. Uh, and the point I would make is that second type of war, that separatist type of war, is much more likely to attract third party support um, for a couple of reasons. One is that the very notion of changing borders is an international phenomenon. Right? Changing governments is a domestic phenomenon. So if a right wing government gives way to a left wing movement, that's something that takes place only within that state. But if you actually have borders changing or some movement trying to change borders, that naturally arouses the interest of uh, bodies in the region. The second thing I would say is, um, because of the way in which borders were drawn, because of the ways in which national communities arose in the last 200 years, uh, you often have a lot of uh, third parties who, either through ethnic affinity, religious affinity, cultural affinity, linguistic affinity, uh, feel some sort of responsibility for a community outside their borders that they feel they have to protect, or they feel they can protect, or they feel they should protect. Um, and we see this, again, in any number of places across time and space, right? You have Armenia interfering with rebels in Azerbaijan. Uh, you have uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia sponsoring rebels on each other's territories. Uh, and South Asia is, again, no different, right? Uh, Bangladesh would not have won independence without India's help. 
and Pakistan has been involved uh, in Kashmir since the beginning. So uh, again, this is a very sort of common type of uh, issue. The third thing I would say is precisely because of uh, these third party interventions, these conflicts tend to get very violent, uh, especially the ones in which third parties have involved heavily as Pakistan has been in, in uh, Kashmir. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that when third parties get involved with nationalist movements, uh, those nationalist movements become a lot stronger than they otherwise would be, right? Uh, because you can have financial aid, military aid, guns, bombs, uh, military training. Uh, all of these types of things make nationalist movements a lot stronger than they otherwise would be. And as a consequence, states tend to use a lot more violence against those types of movements because they're much stronger. Uh, the second thing is that when you have uh, external support, when you, when you sought the support of a, of a rival of the state that you're in, uh, in this case, if, if Kashmir has sought Pakistani support in dealing with the Indian state, uh, that actually engenders this sort of very deep sense of betrayal uh, from the state, right? It's one thing to seek divorce. It's one thing to say, you know what, I want to be on my own. And it's another thing to seek divorce after sort of sleeping with a spouse or sworn enemy, uh, which is what's happening in this case. Uh, and those types of issues often lead to sort of pathological levels of violence, right? You get very, very angry states dealing with nationalist movements who they feel have betrayed the central idea of the state. Uh, so, I mean, again, in South Asia, we've seen a prime example of this, which is the Bengali genocide in 1971. Uh, and if you look at uh, India's treatment of secessionist minorities uh, across time and space, uh, it's, it's very clear that Kashmir has seen by far the heaviest response in that includes Punjab in the 1980s. Um, so, so it's not a coincidence that these third party, uh, that, that way you see third party involvement, you see a lot of violence. So those are the first sort of set of comments. The second set of comments I'm going to make relate to nationalism and national identity. Uh, nationalism is perhaps, in my view, the, the strongest political ideology of the last 200 years. Uh, it's sort of longer lasting than socialism, uh, more widely accepted than liberalism. Uh, but the point I would make is that because it's 200 years old, you have a lot of problems in sort of the post-colonial context. So if you think of South Asia, for instance, uh, India and Pakistan became independent in 1947. Uh, and at that point, nationalism was very firmly embedded in uh, international politics. Uh, and as a consequence, when you have these states coming up in an age of nationalism, you have these states who are incentivized to promote unifying ideologies, unifying identities, right? We're going to study from one history textbook. We're going to speak one language. Uh, we're going to sing one national anthem. Uh, you know, we're going to have one national flag. Uh, and so in a bid to create these uh, unifying ideologies or unifying identities, states often engender uh, backlashes, which is something we've seen across Asia and Africa over the last 60 years. Uh, but precisely because states invest so much time and effort in trying to create one people, you know, through history textbooks and syllabi and flags and anthems, because they invest so much effort, uh, they actually succeed. Uh, and they succeed pretty well in inculcating a sense of nationalism and which is to tie uh, peoples to particular territories, right? This is our land, this is our fatherland, this is our homeland. Um, and as a consequence, when leaders make those sorts of assessments about, you know, this territory belongs to a particular people, uh, they can lock in those, they can lock in those uh, positions, right? Oftentimes you have people negotiating over a piece of land, say, you know, this belongs to us, the other party says, you know, no, no this belongs to us for these reasons. Uh, but the point is, every time, a leader makes a statement like that, or makes an assessment like that. They get, they get locked in, right? Because you have audiences, you have people who are listening to them, who are engaging with them, uh, who remember what they say, right? Uh, we've seen across uh, nationalist disputes related to territory from Jerusalem to Northern Ireland, uh, where these issues did not start off, you know, impossible to solve. They became impossible to solve when people tied the history, uh, tied the territory to a particular people. Uh, and said, you know, there's no way we're going to compromise on this. Um, so that's something to, I think, keep aware of. And I think the sort of lessons for today, the implications of these of these points would be, well, first of all, I would say, leaders have to be careful. Like, you have to, leaders have to be very careful with their rhetoric. Uh, if there is some, you know, potential or some potential for some eventuality of a uh, peaceful, a relatively peaceful resolution of, of the Kashmir dispute, um, it will involve leaders Climbing down from sort of very strong rhetoric about you know what territory belongs to you know who if you convince if you've been telling people a billion people over 60 years that you know Kashmir is an integral part of the Indian homeland well, it becomes very very difficult to climb down from that if it ever comes to pass where you have to make a concession 
The same way if, you know, for 60 years you've been seeing uh, Pakistanis are home to South Asian Muslims, uh, it becomes very, very, very difficult to say, well, no, actually, it's not the home to South Asian Muslims because we've also seen that and we're not going to get Kashmir. So, uh, the only thing I would say is Koreans have to be very careful about the types of things they say because populations remember uh, what they say. The last thing I would say is, again, I know there's a pessimistic and optimistic take coming up. Uh, I'm relatively pessimistic on uh, this issue, at least insofar as any final solution, any final sort of resolution of this dispute uh, is not going to be easy for any of the parties involved. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, separatist conflicts end in one of three ways. One is that the state crushes the nationalist movement militarily. Uh, this is what the Indian state has tried in Kashmir for the last 20 years. By and large succeeded in the 90s. Uh, the problem with trying to crush the nationalist movement is that it may come back, right? You can crush it militarily for over a period of five or ten years, but uh, it may come back. So you have the two other options of making concessions, right? The extreme concession is independence, all right, you become your own state. Uh, first of all, that's quite rare. Very few states win their independence in a secessionist war. Bangladesh is a pretty rare uh, example. Uh, but the issue with independence is, I, I don't know how much Kashmiri nationalists actually want independence, but if they claim they want independence, I would tell them that they're wrong. Uh, because in a world in which Kashmir actually becomes an independent state, that's a world which is not a pleasant one for, for Kashmir, because uh, you're left with a buffer state that is well weaker than all of its rivals, than all of its neighbors, right? Pakistan would be the weakest of its uh, neighbors and it would be much stronger than Kashmir. India would be much stronger than Kashmir. China would be much stronger than Kashmir. Uh, and the lesson of buffer states in international politics is, it's not a happy lesson. Like buffer states do not enjoy a very happy existence in international politics. Whether you're talking about Paraguay or Poland, right, what have you. It's not a good place to be between big powerful states that want part of your land. Uh, so then you come to the third possible solution, which is greater autonomy, which doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon because the Indian state seems to be saying, we're going to take away the autonomy we've already given you rather than giving you more. Give you more. Uh, but one of the lessons from uh, you know, scholars of separatism is that autonomy very rarely dampens uh, long-term you know, desires for independence. Right? The idea is that, oh, we might give them something short of independence so that they no longer want independence in the future. Uh, that's a reasonable claim you would think on the surface, but once time passes, uh, Catalonia would be a perfect example of this. Right? Catalonia has had enjoyed a great amount of autonomy since Franco's death uh, in the mid-70s. Uh, and we're right back to where we started, where Catalonia now wants independence again. So, uh, long term, uh, sort of granting autonomy in the hopes of buying off a uh, nationalist movement, uh, on the surface you would think it works, but it doesn't, empirically, it doesn't seem to work. Uh, so, there's really no obvious good solutions, I think. Uh, but on that very pessimistic note, I'm going to pass over to uh, Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Irfan, for organizing this conference and for inviting me to be a part of it. Uh, just delighted to be here with uh, my colleagues. Um, so I've been watching the Indo-Pakistani conflict over Kashmir for over 20 years. Uh, I served as a diplomat in both Pakistan and India, so I've seen it from both sides. I feel I understand both sides' positions on the issue. <coughs> I also have seen how the U.S. Uh, policy process works around uh, the conflict and how U.S. policymakers deal with the issue, particularly during crises. Uh, I was at the CIA as an analyst in 1999 during the Cargill conflict, and then I was a senior advisor in the South Asia Bureau at the State Department during the 2001-2002 military standoff. So something that has uh, formed my opinions, contributed greatly to forming my opinions on this conflict, was my involvement as the point person in a year-long nation endeavor to free hostages held in Kashmir. This was July 4th, 1995, when a group calling itself al Farag, which is really a nom de guerre for a Pakistan-based terrorist group called the Harakat al Ansar, kidnapped uh, four Europeans and one American citizen, Donald Hutchings. And despite our best efforts of trying to free these hostages, unfortunately, we were unsuccessful. But I learned a couple of things um, by being involved in, uh, in this situation. And the first was seeing firsthand the deep connections between the Kashmir-focused groups, whether that was Lashkar-e-Taiba, 
uh, Har Harakat al-Ansar, which eventually became Harakat al-Mujahideen, and Harakat al-Jihadi Islami. Uh, later, we had Jeshi Muhammad uh, on the scene. So seeing how these groups were deeply connected to groups that would later fight US soldiers in Afghanistan, and namely I'm talking about the Haqqani network. Uh, the second thing was uh, a great deal a source of frustration for me when I saw the US government unwilling to uh, really uh, see through any consequences for Pakistan for its support to groups that were responsible for the killing of US citizens. And unfortunately, we have not seen a change in Pakistan's policies in the last 20 years. And I think Exhibit A uh, can be seen last Friday, when Pakistan released on bail Zakir Rahman Lakhvi, the mastermind of the 2008 Mumbai attacks. Uh, this, of course, was the day after the State Department announced it, would, it had approved arms sales to the tune of one billion in attack helicopters, health fire missiles, and other equipment for Pakistan. So I think this can be seen as a rebuff to US policymakers who are seeking to support Pakistan in its fight against terrorists that attack the Pakistani state. And it's also going to be met with, I would say, probably outrage from the victims' families of these attacks, which include 166 people, including six Americans. And we've already seen the American families have uh, tried to move the U.S. court system to uh, pursue cases against ISI officials who were allegedly, allegedly involved in planning the Mumbai attacks. And of course, we know from Pakistani-American David Headley, who was arrested in Chicago in 2009, and uh, he testified to the U.S. court about meetings that he had with Pakistani ISI military officials involved in the planning of the attacks. So I think unless Zakir Rahman Lakhvi is rearrested, uh, we could see calls from the US Congress to slow down these arms sales or even halt altogether these arms sales that were recently announced to Pakistan. Or we could see a bounty placed on Zakir Rahman Lakhvi, much like uh, the State Department did with the bounty on Hafiz Muhammad Saeed, the leader, or the founder, rather, of the Lashkar Taiba. Uh, so the point here is Pakistan's tool to push its case in the Kashmir dispute has not changed over the last 20 years, which is basically supporting uh, terrorist groups to bleed India. Uh, and I think Pakistan stubbornly continues to pursue this policy, which not only has had consequences for global terrorism, it has backfired on the Pakistani state in the form of the TTP uh, killing you know, thousands of Pakistani civilians and security forces over the last several years. Uh, because it really is the same ideology that drives the TTP to attack the Pakistani state that drives the LET to attack India. So I think until this ideology, this jihadist ideology, is uprooted altogether, Pakistan will continue to bear the brunt of these policies in the form of continued terrorist attacks. And of course, relations with India will continue to suffer. So, you know, I, I've just spelled out how Pakistan's support for these terrorist groups forms the backdrop for the Indo-Pakistani conflict. But another indicator of tensions has been the uptick in cross-border firing across the line of control and the working boundary that divides the two countries. Uh, last fall, we saw the highest number of Indian and Pakistani soldiers killed ever in a one-week period since the ceasefire along the line of control that started in 2003. Uh, another series of incidents along the line of control occurred in December, around the time of the state elections in Jammu and Kashmir. Now, I would point to the elections in J&K as a slightly positive development, uh, potentially. <clears throat> for the future of Kashmir. And that's because of the tie-up between the BJP and the PDP. Because the PDP uh, really enunciates, it's close to the separatists, the PDP party leaders, so they often enunciate uh, the feelings or concerns of the Kashmiri separatists. And so if Modi wanted to make concessions to the Kashmiris, uh, he could 
you know, allow Chief Minister Mufti Muhammad Saeed to do things like, you know, reduce Indian security forces in urban areas, um, pursue investigations of uh, disappeared or, uh, you know, anything dealing with human rights concerns. And he could sort of use, Modi could use the PDP as cover, you know, arguing with his BJP colleagues that, look, we have to make this political partnership work in Kashmir um, and, and let him pursue that. Uh, so I think that that could be a potentially positive development in Kashmir. We saw the new Indian Foreign Secretary, S.J. Shankar, visit Pakistan in early March. Apparently it was a, a good visit, uh, restored some goodwill in the relationship, although I don't think any major issues were discussed. And then we saw just last week that Pakistan actually helped uh, evacuate Indian citizens from Yemen. And so that also created uh, a bit of goodwill between the two countries. So one question is always, what is the U.S. role in this dispute? And I would say that the U.S. really has no role in mediating, trying to mediate the solution. Number one, India does not invite mediation, so you can't really force mediation on the country. Number two, I think the prospect of increased foreign involvement, particularly U.S. involvement, would only spur more violence from the separatists. I think it would, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think it would it would um, prompt them to feel like independence or you know merger with Pakistan was in sight, and therefore they would push the fight more. So I think it could be a very negative um, prospect. That said, I think the U.S. does have a role in quietly prodding the two sides to take steps that reduce tensions. Um, and they, they can certainly do this behind the scenes. Uh, what we've seen in the past is the, is the U.S. is very good at helping to diffuse crises uh, between India and Pakistan when things get out of hand, uh, but really has not been so good at, at uh, getting the two sides to come to any kind of solution. Now, what I believe is most important in resolving this conflict is the U.S. pressing Pakistan to crack down on groups like the LUT. Uh, and it's important to remember that the threat the LUT poses is not just about India. The LUT has connections to international terrorism. It feeds that same ideology that feeds other terrorists that attack the U.S. and other countries. And of course, uh, the U.S. and other countries uh, have been victims of LET attacks. Um, so the third thing, I think the U.S. should be monitoring the human rights situation in Kashmir. There is still alienation among uh, the Kashmiri people. This needs to be addressed. So the U.S. can sort of quietly nudge the Indian government to take these kind of steps. <clears throat> and I recall when Vajpayee was formerly Prime Minister in India, uh, he coined a phrase, Insaniyat, Jamuriyat, and Kashmiriyat. Uh, humanity, democracy, and Kashmiri culture, basically, as defining how he would move forward with the Kashmiris. And I think this was perceived very well. And there was a lot of respect among the Kashmiris for Vajpayee. Um, but I think Modi, uh, there's a lot more skepticism surrounding uh, whether he will pay attention to Kashmiri concerns. So I think it's important that he demonstrates he wants to follow in Vajpayee's footsteps and that he really understands and will address but not only the external dimensions of the conflict but also the internal dimensions. And I would say about uh, former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, while there was no resolution of Kashmir on his watch, Certainly, the two sides did not go to war, even after the 2001 Bai attacks, and I think he deserves credit for that. So the current situation does raise concerns about whether this period of relative calm between the two countries over the last 10 years may come to an end, particularly if there's another major terrorist attack in India. Uh, so that, that's my pessimistic note um, that I'm going to, to end on, and, and I'm just say one last point, which is, um, I think Dr. Butts' overview was excellent, um, really uh, wonderful at putting this into perspective. 
And he makes a point that you know there's all kinds of separatist nationalist movements that happen and how third parties become involved. But what makes this different is, again, this global terrorism element, the fact that uh, the groups fighting in Kashmir have trained with, have um, shared logistics support, you know, cooperated with uh, global terrorists. That's one problem. And the second is, of course, the fact that we're dealing with two nuclear armed nations. So that makes this conflict uh, particularly important uh, for the US to monitor. Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks, uh, Professor Nurudin. Thanks to Georgetown University for inviting me. So I have a few slides which, um, can all of you see this? Okay. Um, I want to take a slightly different sort of approach to this. Um, and optimism is as far from me as it gets, but somehow today I think I'm going to be the most optimistic of the three. Um, you know, India-Pakistan conflict, we always talk about how do you make things move? Because you touch one thing and something else goes wrong. Pakistan says nothing till you discuss Kashmir. We'll discuss others with Kashmir. India says let's talk about economics, let's not talk about Kashmir, etc. Um, so where's the low-hanging fruit? And I want to make three points, basically. One, that Kashmir is the low-hanging fruit. If you start looking at Kashmir, outside of the broader India-Pakistan problem. If you can deal with Kashmir as Kashmir, both countries, India-Pakistan and the Kashmiris, I think Kashmir is the low-hanging fruit, and I'll, I'll sort of talk through that. Second, I have a lot of sympathy for something called CBMs, confidence building measures, because that's the universal punching bag when you can't resolve a conflict. We need more CBMs, we need to put this CBM in place, we need to do that, we need to build confidence. Um, we need to build trust because trust is the real problem. And in Kashmir, over and over again, you've heard, we need more CBMs. And every CBM is sort of cheered. And then we say, we need more, because the two countries are not where they need to be to actually have a solution or a or whatever. And what I'll argue here is that CBMs have actually done more than what they were required to do. And now the real problem here is political will. It's not about this CBM or that CBM. Um, and the final point is that, if you really want to see this as a low-hanging fruit, it bears repetition, uh, what I just said, you have to invert the prism. So far, we've talked about India, Pakistan, and Kashmir as part of that problem. And I would argue that if you start looking at Kashmir and finding how the two sides can live with a solution or an arrangement on Kashmir without worrying about the others, you will actually get something. So what I've done here, uh, and this is something I've been working on for a while, is actually looked at since 1947. What is it that experts, governments, officials, people, whoever, have said could be potential solutions to Kashmir? So that's the first thing I'm going to show you. And then I will look at CBMs on Kashmir and show you where the CBMs fall in relation to what people think could be possible solutions to Kashmir. So, Um, so basically, just very quickly, the sort of 46 proposals that I identified, and this is pretty much the universe, um, looking at what they were saying in terms of the um, solutions. Actually, I can't see this from here, but I'm sure you can. Um, this slide only says that there were three sort of phases in which proposals on Kashmir have come. Uh, the earlier years where you talked about so the UN and the plebiscite and that part, then you've got these 22, 23 years where there's nothing, absolutely no conversation on Kashmir. And then suddenly with the insurgency in the 90s, you've got all sorts of governments, people coming in and saying that you do this and do that. And then in the peace process time, um, in the Musharraf Manmohan Singh period, you, you have some others. What I do then, and you don't have to look at this slide, all I'm telling you here is that I plot every single proposal that was there and identify what are the key elements that they say are required in a solution. 
And so what you find is some of the um, things that are talked about quite often actually get no support um, or very little support. And the two that I would point here, one is independent. So I mean, I think Essence Point, and I, people who sort of study this or are part of this game understand that independence is neither sort of feasible in the sense of political uh, realities, but also what is an independent Kashmir. Um, and then the other thing that was often talked about once upon a time was treating the Kashmir Valley separately than the rest of Kashmir. This also gets no support in, in these proposals. The real ones that you would look at are these. And these change over time, and I'll tell you how. But basically, partition remains uh, important and popular throughout time. Uh, along which line is a question that you know different people have addressed differently. Autonomy for some part of all of Jammu Kashmir is also plebiscite referendum used to be very important in the early phase, disappeared. Soft borders, role for the UN also disappeared over time, role for other international actors, and then formal inclusion of Kashmiris and representatives of Kashmiris in the negotiation process. The key slide is here, sorry, and the last one was demilitarization or force reduction. This is the key slide, I want to spend a minute on this. Uh, slightly difficult to understand, but what I've done is broken the three phases. And the darker the color, the more popular or the more frequently reiterated those, those elements were. And so what you see here is direct vote, which is plebiscite through a UN mandate, was very popular in the first phase. Over time, you started hearing things about autonomy, soft borders, you started hearing things about partition with soft borders, something about demilitarization, but nothing clearly came out. I mean, there were different ideas in, in the 90s, but nothing which was a standout. In the 2000s, it's very interesting that you have a very clear convergence around certain issues. One is autonomy. So I think there's, there's almost a consensus that any solution will need to have autonomy. Along with soft borders, demilitarization, and inclusion of Kashmiri representatives. And the second sort of frequently talked about thing was soft borders, demilitarization, but maybe with some kind of partition. This also remained part of the conversation. But if you want to identify the elements, soft borders, Kashmiri representatives are part of the solution, a demilitarized zone, and autonomy to Kashmir. You will find this in every single realistic proposal that's been put out. All right. In terms of the CBMs, you know, Pakistan and India had like 15 in the 90s, then 93 CBMs between 2000 and 2009. And that's why I feel very sympathetic, because every time they couldn't do anything, they came up with the CBM which was getting an old draft, changing some names and saying, we have new confidence. In what? I don't know. Uh, and then 47 during 2010 and 14. But on Kashmir specifically, sorry, on Kashmir specifically, 90s was sort of the real game. 14 CBMs, uh, sorry, the 2002, uh, 2000 to 2009 period, the peace process period. Um, in the 90s, there was only one, interestingly, in 1999, uh, which was the Lahore MOU right before the Kargil. Uh, episode and that wasn't Kashmir specific. But in 2002 to 2009, you got all sorts of things: ceasefire, travel, ease of travel, visa, ease of visa, uh, business delegations, trade, trade routes, roads, journalists, etc., etc., etc. And then you know ceasefire along the LOC, etc. In, in the last five years. But here's the key slide: if you plot these on what I had initially mentioned were the various themes in the proposals that were recurring. Here is what you get. It's almost 100% convergence on issues like soft borders, role of Kashmiri representatives, and even demilitarization. The CBMs cover all three of these. If you take the CBMs from 2002 to 2009, all the various ideas or proposals put out that were recurring in the, the list of 46 proposals, all of them are here. Not one of them is missing. And you know, across the various CBMs. If you bring all of this together and say, what would be the solution for Kashmir? You're essentially talking about autonomy. You're talking about soft borders. You're talking about demilitarization or massive force reduction. And then you are off and on, depending on who you are you know, looking at, 
talking about some form of conversation about partition of Kashmir. But it's not entirely clear what that would look like, what the line would be, when it would be done. And all of this brought together, surprise, surprise, is exactly what the Pakistani government under Musharraf and the Indian government under Manmohan Singh had come close to agreeing to between 2005 and 2007. So you know, a lot of talk about where did that come from, there wasn't any consensus on it. In fact, that was a very well thought out plan which was based exactly on what I've just presented to you. And once I did this research, I actually went to the Pakistani side and Indian side, and it turns out they were not oblivious to this, not in this format, but they had looked at these proposals, they had seen what was there. And so, if you're really talking about low-hanging fruit, my submission to you is that we actually know the solution to Kashmir. And the solution to Kashmir is something around these elements. Autonomy, soft borders, demilitarization, and some conversation about partition. What was the Musharraf Manmohan Singh formula? Essentially, it was all of this with the idea of a final solution, i.e., partition or not, deferred for some time in the future. And why was that to me, and why is that where these two sides, I am convinced, will end up, no matter when they get back to the table to talk about Kashmir? Because there are two basic hurdles to resolving Kashmir. CBMs is not one of them, I can promise you. Too many of them already. One is political will, and the other is both sides need to be seen as winning somehow. And this is classic IR theory problem. This is not new to Kashmir or anything like that. So on the issue of winning, that idea, the Musharraf and Mohan Singh idea, and whatever you want to call it, I know it's fairly unpopular now to call it with those names, but the idea was essentially simply this. Pakistan would say there is no partition. So we haven't agreed on LOC being the final line. The human rights sort of violations will, will die down when the Indian uh, side demilitarizes. The Kashmiris will have autonomy, so they will have their destiny in their own hands. This is the public relations I'm talking about on the Pakistan side. Um, and then India basically on its side can say we haven't lost any. This is status essentially. And yes, sometime in the future we'll decide the final solution, but at this point we've gotten what we want, and it will also get an opportunity to resolve its problems with the people of the valley with this kind of solution in place, but it can present it as a status quo uh, for, for all uh, one cares. But at the same time, you will have a better day-to-day -day life for the Kashmiris, you will have demilitarization, you will have cross-border movement uh, along the south border, etc. So that's really where they're going to end up at the end of the day. The prerequisite is that you have to resolve the political will puzzle. And I'll end by, by saying um, that on the political will, I think the real problem on political will and the political incentives that are holding off such a movement or solution is actually tied to the larger India-Pakistan puzzle, not to Kashmir specifically. And so rather than talking about that larger puzzle and terrorism is a big part of that and trade is a big part of that and Shiachin is an even bigger part of that and whatever, whatever. Talk about Kashmir along the lines that both sides actually have a solution on paper. Papers exist. It's not a lie. You've got to get back to that point. And I think the only way you can get back there is to talk about political will within a Kashmiri framework. And I also say this for one very simple reason, that for 70 years now, India and Pakistan have talked about Kashmir as an India-Pakistan problem. Nobody is interested in Kashmir for Kashmir's sake. If you invert this prism, I think you will get closer to that point. Otherwise, if we keep dealing with this in the India-Pakistan framework, while I agree with you completely, Lisa, I can promise you that these groups are not going anywhere, and I can also promise you that India is not budging on the status quo. So that's a recipe for Kashmiris not getting the life they want every single day while India Pakistan bash each other for everything that's gone wrong and, and you know blame blame the other rather than looking in one. Let me stop. Wow. Um, that, that was a great start. Uh, thank you all three of you for a really uh, fascinating overview. I'm guessing there's no shortage of questions in the audience and you've been very patient. We have a floating mic. Is that right, Dan? So, if there are questions uh, that you would have, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, Daya will bring you a mic if you would just introduce yourself uh, with your name and affiliation. 
we'd love to take your questions. If not, I've got a million questions for our audience members as well. So. Hi, uh, my name is Seth, and uh, I'm a student at George Washington University. Uh, my question is more about the uh, terrorism aspect of the peace dialogue process, because uh, many people talk about uh, potential, a uh, possible uh, paradigm shift within the military's thinking on its uh, take on terrorism. Uh, and uh, since we talked about the Lakshari Taiba a lot, uh, I wanted to ask uh, what has been uh, the Pakistan military's take on that? Because you have your skeptics who will say that uh, you know the, the Pakistanis are unwilling to abandon uh, the group as a proxy for asymmetric warfare. But then you have other political commentators who are saying that there is a strategy in the works um, uh, to somehow deal with them. And the problem is that you have the Jamaat al-Dawa, which uh, uh, really has won the hearts and minds of uh, many thousands uh, of Pakistanis. So, And I am pretty sure that this is a major hindrance in uh, the peace process. So I just wanted to ask uh, what you believe uh, the military is doing about that, because I do believe there has to be a pragmatic approach to the problem. And then, uh, secondly, if you don't mind me asking, I wanted to ask, uh, what are the, uh, uh, I believe there has to be new dimensions in the whole architecture of the, the peace uh, talks between India and Pakistan, especially when it comes to Afghanistan and the role of terrorism in the region. Uh, I just wanted to ask what your take is on uh, um, that aspect with the whole dialogue process. Thank you. Thank you. I saw one other hand, Jay. Would you like to ask a question? There is a similar question on the okay. there. So. There is a question up here, Dai. We'll just collect both of those and then we'll turn to the panelists. Yeah. I am Ahmad Masli Khan and I'm a freelance journalist. I was wondering if it is possible uh, to demolish the ISI headquarters in Apshara for lasting peace in Kashmir, Afghanistan, and Baluchistan. A simple question. <laughs> uh, it should keep us, give us plenty to talk about for the next few minutes anyway. Uh, Lisa, why don't you start us off and we'll go from there. Okay. Um, I think that was the question on everybody's mind, particularly after the horrific attack in the shower on the school on December 16th when some 130 children were killed. And everybody wondered. Uh, Will this be, you know, Pakistan's 9-11, will this change their policies toward terrorism? Um, I think in some ways it definitely has stiffened their resolve to fight the TTP. Of course, the military has been engaged in operations against the TTP in North Waziristan since last June. Uh, but it also prompted uh, the civilian government to come up with the National Action Plan, which included 20 different points of how Pakistan was going to crack down on terrorism, everything from uh, you know um, doing something about the the narratives coming up in the social media, uh, establishing the military courts. Um, so certainly, you know, I think there there is a sense that Pakistan needs to crack down harder on the TTP. However, uh, I would just note to you that it was it was not even 48 hours after the attack of the shower that this idea of Lucky being let out on bail first came up. The, the, the Pakistan Anti-Terrorism Court basically granted him bail. So to me, this was signaling by the Pakistan military, saying, you know, okay, you know, we have a terrorism problem, we're going to be focusing on that, but India, don't get any ideas. We're not letting go of our LET proxies anytime soon. So in my opinion, this was uh, clearly signaling to India that the LET would remain a proxy for Pakistan. And I heard the arguments that, well, it's a legal case. Pakistan didn't have the evidence to convict him. India hadn't shared the evidence. My personal opinion is uh, if they wanted to convict him, certainly Pakistan could come up with the evidence. I don't think they wanted to convict him. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, while Pakistan is 
increasing its findings to TDP, I, I don't see any change with regard to its support to the LET. I think you still have that dual policy of supporting terrorists that attack India, fighting terrorists that attack Pakistan. Um, and your question about the dimensions of the dialogue, um, I think that's a very interesting question. And I think we, you know, it would be great if India and Pakistan, you know, once the terrorism issue is resolved, but if they could think about a trilateral dialogue that involves the Kashmiris. Because I, I, the uh, part of the uh, presentation that uh, Moeed gave that I agreed with was there has to be a role for the Kashmiris in the dialogue somehow. And unfortunately, I think the Modi government's um, policy on uh, trying to crack down on Pakistan not talking with the uh, Hurriyat is, is not really, I, th I think that's a, a step backward in terms of the overall peace process. I, I know what the Modi government's trying to achieve. You know, they're trying to say this is purely an internal problem. You know, Pakistan doesn't have a role. But I actually think you, you would see the peace process move forward if, you know, Pakistan uh, consults with the Hurriyat, has talks with the Hurriyat, uh, and they're, they're, there's some kind of trilateral mechanism uh, that does bring in the Kashmiris. India doesn't want this, but I think it would be helpful in terms of the, the overall peace process. Do you have any? Or do we have other questions? Before we break to the next panel, I do have one. Um, and I guess I'll address it to Mohit and to Ehsan. Uh, building again on Mohit's point about the role of the Kashmiri people, I guess I'd like to hear more about thoughts about is there a domestic public demand for a solution over here that these leaders that could empower these leaders? So listening to Hassan, for instance, one of the things that came very clearly through was that these leaders have set through rhetorical flourishes, uh, possibly you know, bound themselves into a pretty hopeless situation. Right? And one of the points he kept saying was that, you know, and the people will remember. But that sort of implies that the people won't want their leaders to move away from past positions. That uh, and in fact would sort of reward someone who could, you know, end this, uh, end this mess. And so, in the spirit of sort of what do we know about what the Kashmiri people want, right? Who speaks for them in a sense, in a legitimate manner, and as well as sort of what do we know about what the Indian and Pakistani populations more generally want that might empower someone willing to find a solution? Uh, do we know anything about that? I guess I'm not asking so much the speculators to tell us if we have any evidence that we can build on. Um, Two or three things on this. So, I think all you have is basically polling data on Section 7, which is not too good, quite honestly. Um, the one thing I'll say on the Kashmiri people is both side ha sides have twisted what they want the world to know about what the Kashmiri people think. Um, you know, are we talking about the Valley, are we talking about Jammu, are we talking about which Kashmiri leader? So, so it depends. There's no real objectivity in how this is portrayed. What is clear throughout the uh, you know, 70 years, is that they want a solution. I mean, there's no debate about status quo not being uh, acceptable to the average you know, person there. Um, beyond that, the argument that I've heard many times in Delhi and Islamabad, well, you know, internally Kashmir is a mess, who speaks for whom, is it? that's only natural. I mean, you've got the same elite interest, the same elite capture, the same political sort of divisions that you would have anywhere. And when you have conflict, in such an emotive conflict, you're going to have more of it. And so I think to hold that against you know, the Kashmiris don't know what they want, I, I think is fairly harsh. Um, India, Pakistan. In Pakistan, actually, we do have good survey data now, which tells us that the current generation is actually not interested. You know, the, it's basically much more liberal in its orientation in terms of India and Kashmir than maybe the elder generation was. And so, you know, free movement between India and Pakistan is a very large majority. Talking about Kashmir is a large majority. Also partly because of what has happened internally in Pakistan over the past 10 years. In India, I think it's gone the other way. Um, after Mumbai, I find there's a very strong anti-Pakistan sentiment for good reason, but, but it exists. And that's precisely why I'm saying that if you keep putting Kashmir in the India-Pakistan box as one of the things to discuss, 
it will never move because terrorism will come or Pakistan will have something else to say, etc. You have to deal with Kashmir in this framework and realize that both sides have a solution. We'll come back to that solution one way or another whenever you get there. But if those quiet conversations can begin, I think you'll get further on Kashmir than having to talk about what an average Indian or Pakistan is. Okay. Um, we have uh, run out of time. We could obviously talk a lot more with these three individuals, but the conversation will keep going. Uh, join me in thanking uh, all three of our panelists this afternoon. Uh, we take a very short break, and I mean it, take two minutes, there's water, drinks in the back. Grab yourself a refreshment, come back to your seats, and we'll have to start our next panel at 2 o'clock. Thank you.